Good morning and welcome to St George's this morning. My name is Ed Moll. Later on, Simon Evans will be preaching as we gather for Gogglebox Church, which I'll explain again in a moment, and there'll also be a service of communion a bit later on. Uh, for those on the live stream, you'll be joining us later, and we'll upload this as soon as we can. Now, Gogglebox Church means that uh, certainly at 9.30 we had all ages together, and so we've stopped at a few times to have a, a chat with one another, uh, kind of across the pew. Imagine you're at home, and this is the sofa that you're chatting across. And so here is your first chance to get to do that, find someone to chat to. And here is the first question. Um, share with others a time when you were preparing for something or someone. A time when you're preparing for something or someone. Just a minute to talk about that. Off we go. Well, if I could ask you to look up there. Within the church's year, we've just entered the season of Advent. And for many people, we see Advent as being a time to lead up to Christmas. Perhaps you've got an Advent calendar you're looking forward to starting this year. But within the church's year, Advent reminds us that Jesus who came once will come again. And Advent is actually a season in which we prepare for that. So as our opening prayer, I thought we'd use the set prayer for the first Sunday in Advent, and it'll come up on the screen. And I invite you to join me in these words as we pray that God would help us to get ready and be ready. So let's pray. Almighty God, give us grace to cast away the works of darkness and to put on the armour of light. Now, in the time of this mortal life, in which your Son, Jesus Christ, came to us in great humility, so that on the last day, when he will come again in his glorious majesty to judge the living and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal through him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Well, we need to cast away the works of darkness because um, they are there within us. And uh, the great news is we can come to God who is light to find forgiveness. And so I'm going to invite you to do that with me. We have some words of confession coming up. And this is an opportunity to acknowledge our darkness and to bring it to God who is light. Will you pray with me? Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore to us the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We are forgiven because of Jesus. We stand with confidence in God's presence because of Jesus. Let's stand and celebrate that. And I invite you, if you're able to, please pop on a mask as we stand to sing here in the presence.
Do please have a seat. <clears throat> well, uh, on the Sunday mornings, we've been looking at a number of questions that people have about the Bible. And today, Emma is going to help us answer uh, one particular question. Let's hear from Emma. Leviticus tells me to hate ones, but I love them. Is God unhappy with me? Are there really only 144,000 people in heaven? Jesus said, and if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. Does that mean no one in our church has sinned with their right hand? These are great questions to ask, and they might be ones that you've thought about when reading the Bible. Behind all of them is the one big question. How do I know when I'm reading the Bible what to take literally, and what to take metaphorically. When we read other texts, we have rules or guides to help us understand them. For example, when reading a storybook, we start at the beginning and read every page until we get to the end. When reading a recipe, we read it in order and don't expect a cake to appear unless we follow the instructions. When using a dictionary, we look up a word by using the alphabetical order. Most of us don't read a dictionary like a storybook. 
Just like other texts, when we read the Bible, we need to know the rules or the guides as how to read it. So we'll be reading one part of the Bible and it will be poetry. And so there'll be certain rules for that. We'll read another part of the Bible and it will be story, historic narrative. And so therefore there'll be other rules for that. And some parts of the Bible we'll read that are written from a person to other people and we'll need to know how to read them. Well, if you want to think about this more or want more help, then I can recommend, recommend a really great book called Dig Deeper. And it helps you to know those rules and have those tools uh, so that you can know how to read the different parts of the Bible and whether to take them literally or whether to take them metaphorically. Let's think about the first question. It's important to know who God gave that rule to and when. Where in the one big story of the Bible does this happen? This is part of God's law to the Israelites. And very simply put, everything that happened then points to Jesus. So we need to listen to Jesus. When Jesus came, he declared all foods clean. And because Leviticus points to Jesus, then we need to listen to Jesus. We can enjoy prawn. But it is important not to then just ignore Leviticus. All of the Bible is God-breathed. Therefore, God has lots to tell us through Leviticus, just like the rest of the Bible. It is sweeter than honey. And as we use the right tools, pray for help and read it more and more, we will taste and see that God is good. I encourage you to do that daily this week. And if you've got questions, then come to Cafe Church tonight. Thank you, Emma. And so talking of questions, it's a chance again to have a little chat in Pew Groups. Two questions to think about. First is, what struck you from what Emma said? And second is, has that given rise to other questions? Sometimes when you're watching, it, it spring, more questions spring to mind. And just dance, chat about that, and then uh, you can hang on to those questions. So a couple of minutes of chat, and then I'll pop up again and lead us to the next thing. Well, if we look up there, I know sometimes when I'm thinking about certain questions, it gives rise to other questions. And so 
Just to remind you, this afternoon we have something called Cafe Church Q&A Cafe because we're particularly wanting to ask and address questions that people have. So that's at 5.30 for food if you've signed up, 6.30 for leftovers and um, may or no food at 6 o'clock. 5.30 for food, 6 o'clock for leftovers or not. And um, that's Cafe Church this afternoon. Also, all of our Bible answers are, are on a YouTube playlist, which um, are referenced in the email. Um, I'm not sure how else you can find it. Search it on YouTube, but there it is. We're going to turn to the Bible next. Um, in a moment, Marianne is going to read. Then we're going to sing a song, which is um, a bit of an action song. It was really cold at 9.30. It's a bit warmer now, um, but it's an all-age song for all of us. And then uh, straight into um, Simon Evans leading us on being a good neighbour. So let's hand it over to Marianne for our Bible reading. And, and the reading can be found on page 1189. And it's 2 Thessalonians, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 to 10. Paul, Silas, and Timothy. To the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love of all of and the love all of you have for one another is increasing. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. All this is evidence that God's judgment is right, and as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you because you believed our testimony to you. This is the word of the Lord.
God's love is big, God's love is great, God's love is fab and he's my mate. God's love surrounds me every day and I love to sing and say God's love is big, God's love is strong, God's love goes on and on and on. God's love surrounds me every day. Well, thank you very much. Um, yes, that was a, a livelier version than at 9.30 this morning, I think. So uh, uh, well done to everybody. Well, we're going to be thinking this morning about um, being a good neighbour. I guess that's quite a wide subject which we could approach from various angles. But um, let's see how we do um, this morning. Um, before we look at it, shall we just commit our time to um, God in prayer? Shall we come before him? Father God, as we uh, turn to your word now, we thank you for the truth of it. Um, we thank you, Father God, for this time where we can set aside to uh, listen to you. And, and Father, we pray that your spirit would uh, touch our hearts and uh, challenge us, encourage us. Um, we pray uh, as we commit this uh, time into your hand. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the late 1980s, I don't know if you can remember, but uh, there was uh, an Australian soap that hit um, the English schedules or British schedules, which was called Neighbours. Um, and um, I think it's running on one of the other channels still now, but I remember in its heyday, it uh, managed to fill our university common room every weekday at about 1.30. People used to cram in, um, and as the uh, titles rang out, um, people would gather and find their favourite uh, seat. Um, and the, the lyrics of the introductory title was, Neighbours, everybody needs good neighbours. Now, this is the... The, the, the line that people misunderstood sometimes, with a little understanding, you can find the perfect blend. Neighbours should be there for one another. That's when good neighbours uh, become good friends. Um, and if you're um, of a certain age, you can probably visualise now that 3D hexagonal shape coming towards you with the Grundy TV logo um, being presented on the screen. Well, whatever you think of the Australian soap, um, far more importantly, the Bible has uh, a lot to say about being a good neighbour. In the Gospel according to Luke, uh, it's recorded in chapter 10 of Luke's Gospel, Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. And in the parable, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. It was a, a, fairly, or a very savage attack and he was left for dead. And in the parable, a priest went past and then a Levi went past. Both saw the plight of this man and yet both of them passed by without any attempt to intervene to help. And finally, a Samaritan came past. And someone, incidentally, a, a Samaritan was somebody who was culturally very different to the Jewish man who'd been attacked. But he saw him, he had compassion on him, and he intervened to save him. Now, in the parable, the neighbor was the one who showed mercy, the one who had compassion for the one who was in front of him. You know, at the outset, I want to establish a principle that 
A good neighbour is in fact a loving neighbour. One who has compassion on those in front of them within their own community, irrespective of any cultural barriers that may exist. During recent uh, restrictions and, and, and during lockdown in particular, I think many might say that there has been a, a, an increased sense of community. I wonder if we were to poll people um, outside um, today, um, a sample of people, how many would say that they have spoken to more people in the last two years than they did previously in their neighbourhood? There's been, hasn't there, a sense in which none of us wanted to go through this experience alone. As Christians, we believe in the Trinity of God. At the very heart of who God is, we see a relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so as as Christians, we have the ultimate reason to believe in the power and the, the value of community. And as such, we should be those who have a desire to build and nurture community. In the time we've got this morning, I want to think about our motivation as Christians for being a loving neighbour. And also our practical response to this. So our motivation and our practical response. So let's firstly in order to find out the motivation for us making loving connections with our community, let's consider the verses we've read from 2 Thessalonians. Well, Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians is a word, essentially a word of encouragement to a church facing hostile pressures from people outside, from, from unbelievers. They were being persecuted and suffering all sorts of trials, and yet we see from Paul's letter here recorded in 2 Thessalonians, there was a a clear evidence that the church was uh, not succumbing to that pressure, but rather was growing in practical Christian qualities, was growing in spiritual strength. And so the thanks that Paul is expressing for them as a church, it's not just an empty formality, These were sincere words. And the evidence he saw caused him to speak highly of them to other churches. There are two things that I want to very carefully extract from this really quite strong passage. Firstly, God's judgment is very clearly seen in the end position of those who would reject the message of salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who would choose to ignore the warnings. Verses 6, 8 and 9 specifically make very clear that those who choose to reject the gospel come under judgment. You know, we really should see this judgment for what it is. It is not a, a vindictive punishment but rather an upholding of justice. Those who would be judged are those who had willfully rejected the message of the gospel. They had refused the loving offer of God. It's the Apostle Paul again who speaks in Romans 5 verse 10, where he says, where we were God's enemies, when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him. In other words, our relationship was restored through the death of his son. Now, the offer of salvation is universal, but reconciliation to God is for those who believe and accept the truth of the gospel. The second point from the passage, and this is more brief. God is vindicating or or proving right his own people against those who have rejected the message or even oppressed the believers. And and this is seen in verses 5, 7 and 10 of the passage we read. And the message is clear that if the believers hold fast, if they stand up to persecution, well then they will inherit 
God's kingdom. And so then as a church at Thessalonica, they were growing in faith. They were advancing the gospel. They weren't retreating in the face of opposition. And why, why is this? Well, it was because they clearly understood the importance of the message that they were proclaiming. They recognized the plight of those who were around them, those who had not yet heard or not yet responded to the gospel. And so the church here at Thessalonica were not, were not just resting in the knowledge and the security of their own salvation. They weren't passing by on the other side to use the language of the parable. They wanted to tell those around them of the impending danger. And remember, they did this not in their own strength, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit empowered them and unified them in their mission. And this is something, isn't it, that we should really grasp hold of as we contemplate a passion for life in the weeks and the months um, to come. I don't know how you feel about crosswords. Um, Jackie likes doing crosswords. Um, I, I, I hate doing crosswords. But there was a clue in a, a paper recently um, uh, for a crossword which said, the telling to someone of an impending danger, seven letters beginning with W. The first service got it very quickly. What, yeah, well, yeah, okay, warning. Yeah. <laughs> warning. Warning. You know, the believers at the church at Thessalonica were, were warning the community around them of the impending danger of unbelief. And in the same way today, we as believers, we are called to warn, to challenge, to alert. And, and this is something we do not because we want to be objectionable to our neighbours or those people in our community, but because we love them. You know, the classic cliche example is, um, if you know that the bridge ahead is down, you tell those people so that they can avoid the impending danger. It's the person filled with indifference, the person filled with apathy, the, the person filled with a, a carelessness who refuses to warn. Now, I do recognise that that refusal to warn may happen sometimes because of fear, but also maybe because of a false understanding of tolerance. But can I suggest there's nothing loving in neglecting to warn someone of an impending danger. To warn someone in those circumstances is the most loving thing that we could do. 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 3 says it's Paul addressing the church in Thessalonica we remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labour prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. And so I hope we can see that it was love that motivated the Thessalonian Christians to persevere in the gospel. And surely we should have the same motivation as we consider those living around us. And I don't pretend that that's easy all of the time. Now, I want to come back from this point and show that it was the Apostle Paul who had initially modelled this pattern of behaviour to the Thessalonians. And as we do that, we'll move on to our final consideration this morning, which is our own practical response. If you've got your Bibles open still, um, perhaps turn back a couple of pages to 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians. Uh, so 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and I'm just going to read verses 4 to 9. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verses 4 to 9. We read this encouragement. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering 
with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Let's drop down to verse 7, and we read this. The words will appear on the screen in just a second. Um, It starts off by saying, Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, it kicks in, So we cared for you. We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. You know, Paul, a missionary to Thessalonica, was delighted to share this wonderful good news with the community. He preached with conviction and power and with the Holy Spirit. He spoke clearly. And he saw many come to trust in Jesus for themselves. The new believers began to share the message as well, but they they didn't just speak it. Paul is quite clear on this point. It's not only the gospel of God that they shared, it was their lives too. Paul lived amongst the Thessalonians for their sake. He treated them as brothers and sisters. And this familial... um, Devoted love was radically different. And in this, we see the the personal application or the, the practical response. It's the kind of love that we're called to give, not only to other Christians, but also to our community, our neighbors, our friends, our work colleagues. And it's into these relationships that Paul and the others loved dearly. So he spoke the message clearly, but he also loved dearly. Even through suffering and hardship in many situations. You know, it wasn't just Paul and those in his immediate circle that practiced this. Early Christianity grew explosively for nearly three centuries. Whilst a few individuals would have engaged in public speaking or public preaching, the majority of the early church didn't because it would have been too dangerous. It was hard to be a Christian and and yet the church still grew. How was that? Well, Tim Keller, a Christian writer, explains it like this. Once non-believers were attracted to the community by the lives of Christians, they became open to talking about the gospel truths that were the source of this kind of life. I want to read that again. Once non-believers were attracted to the community by the lives of Christians, they became open to talk about the gospel truths that were the source of Of this kind of life. So, our response to this should surely be to press in to our communities, to not avoid the conversations at the school gates, to be part of the social gathering with colleagues outside of work to engage in conversation and offer practical help to our next-door neighbours to be the first to welcome people to our streets or community. Essentially to model a Christianity that involves us loving dearly and living lives that attract others. I've got another quotation I'm, I'm coming into finish very soon. Quotation from C.S. Lewis. To the ancients, friendship seemed the happiest and most fully human of all loves. The crown of life and the school of virtue. The modern world, in comparison, simply ignores it. 
And that's a challenge, isn't it? And so as we, as we close, as we come to the end of this section of our service, let's take some time to pause and reflect on our own community relationships, on our own friendships with those in front of us. And I wonder, I challenge myself with this as well, are they driven with, are they driven by love? Are they, are they self-sacrificial? Are they characterised by generosity? Let's also be intentional in our friendships. And finally, let's be known as those who build community. Well, this is Gogglebox Church, so we're going to give you a couple of minutes now to have a chat. Um, If you're at home on a sofa, um, if uh, you're in church here, Um, in your pews and the two questions are going to come up Um, identify some of the people in the community God has placed you you don't have to give names just describe characters perhaps or where they live or how they fit into your life so identify some of the people in the community God has placed you and the second question think of practical ways in which you could share your life with these people uh, for the sake of the gospel so just a couple of minutes to have a chat uh, and then we'll draw back together after that Well, we're going to continue to respond to God's word. Thinking of application is one way. Um, In a moment, we're going to pray. Bill is going to lead us. Then we're going to sing. And then we'll celebrate Holy Communion. So let's hand over to Bill to lead us in our prayers. we pray. A loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that once more as a church family, we are able to bring our prayers and supplications to you. As we hear of tragedy, danger, and see inconsistency and unreliability in governance, we thank you that you are a constant, loving, and righteous God. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Your continual provision and care for us calls for worship, thanks, and praise. Despite all that our daily life throws at us, whether that be in work, school, play, sickness, or health, we rejoice in the knowledge of the certainty of our salvation through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. As poor, weak vessels of clay, we thank you for the forgiveness 
of all our shortcomings and ask that you will allow your spirit to mould us into useful members of your kingdom. As we begin the approach to this very busy time of the year, there is much to bring before you. We ask that your hand will be upon and in all the planning and resourcing that is needed so that those in the, who live in this area will have opportunities to gain a personal knowledge of the life and work of the baby whose wondrous birth we are about to celebrate. We ask that you particularly bless the preparations for the heart of Newtown craft and nativity activity. As we look towards Christmas, we lift up to you all who mourn loved ones who have been lost recently or during the year. We particularly remember Michael Tinker and his family and the family of David Wright. We are aware of how family orientated this time is and how hard it will be to see an empty chair at a festive meal or experience the lack of a regular visit or call. Lord, bring love, comfort and hope into these families that memories will be sweet rather than bitter. For similar reasons, we bring before you all who for whatever reason experience the reality of loneliness. We ask that you draw alongside them and give comfort and peace. We continue to remember both the members and the work that you have here at St George's. We ask for physical protection and spiritual growth. We include our extended family of mission partners and ask that you continue the directions in which they move, that they might continue to demonstrate your great love for all individuals, regardless of race, colour, affluence or poverty. Through these works, your gospel goes forth clear and powerfully. For this, we give you thanks. Now, as we look further ahead, we call down your blessings on the Passion for Life mission planned for next year. That venues are found and secured. That the right speakers are led to join in. That formats are decided on wisely that the organisers and leaders know your guidance in all matters and that you will provide willing workers to join the harvest of souls for your kingdom. And finally, we close our prayers by bringing before you Georgie Moore and his family as they bring him to baptism this afternoon. Please bless that family as they commit to leading Georgie to faith. Lord, we bring all our prayers before you in the knowledge that you are a loving and bountiful God who loves us to talk to you. We ask all this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Sacrificed 
risked your life so I could live Now nothing is holding me back from you Redeemer of my soul Now nothing can hold me back from you Your love will never let me go Thank you for your death and then resurrection. Thank you for the power of your blood. I am overwhelmed by your affection. The kindness and the greatness of your love. The kindness and the greatness of your love. Have a seat. Now, as we come to communion, what we're doing in communion is proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes, which is a very appropriate way to begin and end Advent. And if you uh, know the Lord and are at peace with your neighbors, then this is a good thing to do. It may be that you don't feel ready to do that today. Maybe you're not a Christian believer, or maybe you're not at peace with the people that you need to be at peace with, in which case, please do what uh, is right for you. As a reminder, practicalities-wise, we will bring the bread and the wine to you. We will then try and eat and drink together, but don't worry if you miss the cue. Um, it's, that's not that important. But whatever we do won't uh, really mean anything unless our hearts are right. And so we're going to use a prayer which uh, some may remember uh, called the Prayer of Humble Access, which invites God to help us to set our hearts right and to receive rightly. And I invite you to join me in these words of this prayer. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the sacrifice of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, as we eat the bread and drink the wine, that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen.
Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, in your great love you gave your only Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption. On the cross, he made a full atonement for the sins of the whole world through his once-for-all sacrifice of himself. On the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and gave thanks to you. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, to remember me. Hear us, merciful Father, as we eat this bread and drink this wine, allow us to share together in all that Jesus won through his body that was broken and his blood that was shed. Amen. So the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for you, preserve your body and soul to everlasting life. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith.
the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for you. Reserve your body and soul to everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you, and be thankful. So as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Kingdom, power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, in communion, we declare the death of the Lord. In our final song, we're going to sing that there is a Redeemer. Let's stand to sing. When I stand in glory, I will see his face. What a wonderful prospect. Well, just before our closing prayer, a couple of things to mention in terms of what's coming up next. Advent um, in the church year has started. For many of us, it begins this week. 
You might have an advent calendar. You might have chocolate in it. Well, what is sweeter than honey? Well, let's find out uh, with this uh, little advert for our advent readings. So the idea is every day there'll be a reading or a little video uh, just to help us focus on through Advent. And uh, if you're part of the email list, you'll get that. If you'd like to receive that and haven't, then get in touch with uh, the church office, Emma or Joe. Use the website and they will put you in touch with that. The other thing to mention is we've got uh, some great things lined up for Christmas. We think that they are pretty much all able to carry on much as planned, um, even if we're on plan B or whatever it is that we're going to have in the next few weeks. We have some cards because we'd love the whole parish to know about this and to have a chance to celebrate Christmas. So there are a few still to be delivered. It is a glorious day today, 20 minutes out in the sunshine, delivering some cards. It's a great way to put, get Sunday lunch around the corner. So um, do take some if you're able to help. And do think about how you could invite friends, neighbours, uh, colleagues and others to celebrate Christmas together. All the details on the website, and we'll keep that up to date if and as the situation changes. But Christmas is not going away. Well, let's uh, finish and perhaps think about the week ahead and the people you're going to meet. And as I pray this closing prayer, let's, let's um, point ourselves in God's strength towards those things. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen. Thank you for your fellowship. Goodbye and God bless. <laughs>